to Module 7 of the course called Coding for Crosswords. For more information on the full course, please see the links below. In this module, we're going to tackle a tough subject uh, that is reading from a file. Now, we need this functionality for two purposes in this course. One is to read the grid. We want to start with a crossword grid. And then the second function is to read the library. We want to read a library of words that contains all the legal words that we're trying to construct the crossword around the seed entries. Um, and so there's really no way we can avoid grappling with reading from a file. If you want to skip this lecture, it's okay for a while. You can get by without knowing every detail of this. Um, unfortunately, this topic is kind of in the details and that has nothing to do with C++. That has to do with the history of file formats in computing platforms. And so I'm gonna take some time to kind of back away from our crossword examples and just talk about a few things such as the ASCII encoding format and then the file formats and how they differ particularly with the end of line character on different platforms. Um, so let's start first by talking a little bit about the ASCII encoding. Let's go to the source window here and we'll bring up the code that we used last time even though we're not going to use much of it. I'm going to go to the very bottom of it I'm going to just leave all this code, but I'm going to comment it out just so we can use the same file. And I'm going to investigate what it means when you say something like this. String s equals dog, okay? Now this is a three character string. And we can, we know how we've printed it. We've done this before. And furthermore, we can print individual characters of it. Let's just do this first, just to start getting going. Um, let's go to the execute window and I'll show you what this does. So um, as before, uh, I use G++ on this platform. Um, see module two if you need to review how to compile code on your own platform, whether that's Windows or Macintosh or a browser or Linux. In my case, it's G++, the output file is A, the input file is a.c is what I call my C++ files just because it's easier. So I compile that and then I run it and we're going to see it prints the string dog and then it prints each letter d-o-g. But what really are those letters? Um, and each letter is a byte. A byte is eight bits and that lets you express any value between zero and 255. Now you may have heard of something called Unicode, which is useful to express things like Chinese or Japanese characters or emojis or more complicated characters. For the purpose of this course, we're going to stick with just ASCII encoding, which is an 8-bit encoding. So all you get with ASCII are the letters, you know, A through Z lowercase, A through Z uppercase, numbers, and then some assortment of symbols like, you know, addition, multiplication, pound sign, and then a few more miscellaneous signals are all packed into that 256 uh, spaces. So we'll go look at that in a minute, but first let's just look at this example. We'll go back to the source window and um, one way to try to investigate that encoding is to force these to be converted. So let's say lowercase d is a variable that we will assign the first character of s. Uh, and then let's just do it like this, D-O-G, right? And then instead of printing the D-O-G, let's print the these variables. Now, uh, maybe this is a little confusing. I can just do uh, X, Y, Z. Maybe it's easier. Otherwise, it <laughs> might be too confusing. So let's run this, and I'll show you what this gives. And there you go. Now it's printing 68, 79, and 71. So what are these numbers and what does that mean? Well, to answer that, let's go to the browser window and let's just look up what ASCII is. And there's any number of these. You can just type in ASCII and find um, 
any number of tables, or you can even look out of the images and see tables of these. But this is the ASCII character set. Um, and you can see, all we need to look at for now is this decimal column. Don't worry about that. This is hex and octal, which for historical purposes are other ways to encode these letters. But it's just counting up from zero in the decimal column. Here it goes 31, here's 63, 95, and then 127. So this is the actually just the 7-bit encoding ASCII, uh, which gives you values from 0 to 127, and that encodes all the standard characters. So look at 68. Where do you think 68 is in this table? And here it is, right here, right? Whoops, I can't highlight it. But it's this D. 68 is a D, and what do you guess? 79 is here, 79 is an O, and 71 is a G. So that tells you that um, that's the underlying representation. When the computer prints out a DOG, it's actually stored in the computer as a 68, a 79, and a 71. Why do we need this information? Unfortunately, you have to understand this to understand the line feed problem. So let's continue to investigate the ASCII encoding. Let's go back to the source window and let's try something. Let's try modifying one of these. Instead of, instead of DOG, why don't we set something to be, let's set this to be a different character, maybe C. So instead of dog, we're going to change this string to be cog. Now let's see if this will work. So we assign dog to S, D-O-G, and then we're going to overwrite that first character from a D to a C. Now there's two ways to do it. C++ allows you to specify any character with the single quote. You know how we use the double quotes here to quote an entire string. If you use just a single quote in C++, it will give you the integer value of that character. So in this case, it'd be in the browser window. If we said C, if you go over here to the browser window, we would expect it to give 67, right? So here was what we're gonna do. First of all, we're gonna print out S, and then we're gonna also print out, we're gonna print out, maybe we can try it this way. And we can also print it out. Yeah, that's probably fine. So let's try that. Go to the execute window and let's run that. Right, and so you see that we've replaced the D with the C. But now instead of the C, let's actually put in the ASCII value of the C. And that is going to be again 67. So let's try this. Let's see if we get the same answer, and, and we do. Okay, so why is that important? It's important because there have been three major standards, which are all different, about how to indicate the end of a line. When you read a file, you're reading all these characters, and you're reading these ASCII characters one by one, like we've been showing here. When you get to the end of a line, um, there's a special character used to indicate that the line is over and you're gonna start again. And it involves combinations of two of these ASCII characters. Let's go back to the browser here and look at this table. There's an important one called with, with, with decimal value 10 called LF or line feed. And then there's another one with decimal value 13 called carriage return. Now, um, in the old days of teletypes, those were separate concepts, you'd actually use a carriage return to move the head of the, the printer was printing, mechanical printer, and it would move the head back to zero, and then line feed would take you down a line. And the fact that those were two separate characters was used to do some of that ASCII art, you remember from the dot matrix printers. They would print a line and they'd do a carriage return, but they would not do a line feed, and they could print over the same line multiple times. And if you're clever about the way you pick your letters, you can pick letters that when printed over printed each other um, will create really beautiful artwork and that's a whole thing called ASCII art and just for fun you can go to a browser here and type in ASCII art and um, go to the images and you can see all these beautiful images uh, well beautiful is so maybe an eye of the beholder but this is all done with that method where you're over printing so that's just for historical uh, note but it created confusion because when Unix came out and then Linux copied that. 
uh, they indicated the end of the line purely with only the line feed character, the new line they call it, and that's this 10. They didn't put a carriage return in. So it's more simple, it's more elegant in a way because it's only one character. Um, now Macintosh came along and to be different said, let's not do that. Let's pick one character, but let's, let's pick the carriage return. So they end lines with a carriage return. And then Windows, or DOS originally, um, came out with another standard, which is to put both of them. So let me go to a web page here to show you how that looks. And these pages are a little bit hard to find. Here, I'll show you how you get to them. You type in something like end of line character in files, right? And it'll show you a whole bunch of results. And it, it's a well-known topic and it causes a lot of confusion. So there's a ton of web information about this. Let me show you one that I think makes makes it clear. It's an it's actually an answer to a Stack Overflow pro, uh, uh, post. And it says it right here. Okay, this is the part I want you to look at. It's this part right here. It shows you three, in fact, four, but it's really just three ways of doing this. So here's the Windows version. They use the backslash R and then a backslash N. Okay, so hang on to that information in your head for a minute. Let's go back to create a test file that we're gonna read, right? So here we go. In my platform, I use VI. If you're on Windows, you should use Notepad. It's really important to use an editor that will create a raw text file. You don't want a .doc or any other kind of rich text format. That adds all kinds of other characters that we don't want to read in our program. So you must create a vanilla TXT file on a Windows platform, and Notepad is the best way to do that. On Linux, I use VI here to do that. And I'll call it test, okay? And I'm gonna create a file with two lines in a dog and cat, let's say, okay? That's gonna be our, our sample file to read. Now let's write the code that will read that. And there's a bunch of ways to do this. I'll show you in the browser here. If you just type in how to read files in C++ here, um, you will see um, a ton of answers. Um, W3Schools, again, is a good one to go to. Um, they're gonna show you what to do. Um, I'm gonna show you pretty, pretty close to that um, here. Let's pop back and I'll show you the, pop back to the source window and I'll show you the way I like to do it, it doesn't matter a lot. Um, there's a concept of a file object, um, and that comes from, you need to put an include file that is this one called fstream. That gets you the functions that let you read and write files. So once you include fstream, um, then you come down, let's, 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 let's erase this temp code here, and let's put in that we want a thing called an input f stream, an if stream, let's just call it f for file. And we're going to do some functions on an if stream. The one that we want is open, but now we're gonna give that an argument in here. Remember how we put all the inputs to the functions in here. We're gonna give it the name of the file and we're gonna just give it test because we called our file test. Now on Windows, you may need to put the full path name in there, depending on where your execution environment is running the program. So you can do the whole path like C colon, you know, backslash, and then the whole file path to your file. Or, or you could create the file up at the root directory of your disk, might be an easy way to do that. But you've gotta put in here a specification of where the program can find your sample test file with the dog and the cat line in it. So once you open it, um, we are going to introduce a new concept called a while statement, okay? A while statement is, some, is another loop, like a for loop. It will loop over the guts, so whatever you put in these braces, it will keep doing while this thing is true. And the thing that's useful to test here is that the F, the IF stream object itself, um, actually it'd be worth going back to the browser. Let's go back to the browser and let's, let, and let's look at that object. So let's do a C++ IF stream. Um, and let's let's go to the reference page and I'll just show you. This is where you will find all of these um, functions, right? So we, we did it open first. So this is how to open the file. And then now we're going to um, use this function called EOF, end of file. 
It's a query that you ask the file object, are you done? Have we read everything in this file yet? And so what we can do, let's go back to the source window here, is we can call that function. We can say, hey, file, while you are at the end of file, keep reading. Now wait, is that right? Think about that logic. What do you want to do? You want to say, read this thing while we're not at the end of file, right? So that actually has to be not. And the not operator is a, is a exclamation mark in C++. So you say, while we're not end of file, keep reading. Okay. And what we want to do here is have a line that we're going to read. It's just a string. Each, each line in the file can get read into a string. And there's a function, built-in function called get line, which comes in the, in the, in the F stream library. Um, and we can say F um, line, right? This will read from the file F uh, one of the lines into line. So let's print it then, okay, like this. And let's see what this does. Let's just give this a try. So this is the first challenge. Type this code in. Oh, and I may have made a mistake there. Let me see. It looks okay. We have an F. We open it. We check if it's end of file. We've included the right include file. We read a line in. We print it. And then we go back and we keep reading another line until we're done. So we expect this to just print out dog cat. Um, let's go ahead and do that as a challenge. Give that a try on your own and see what you get out of that. Okay, welcome back. Let's see how you did. Here's the file, just to remind you, that's the file we just created, dog, cat. And what we're going to do now is compile this thing we made. Okay, and then we're gonna run it. And there it goes, it says dog, cat. I put dog, cat um, right away. Now, what did you notice about that? It stripped the line feed out. So the get line call reads up until the end of the line character, and then it strips the line character out um, now, why is it important that I said all that stuff before about reading platforms? Because this works on Linux. If you're reading on Windows, um, you may need to understand that the line terminator um, is different. Or furthermore, if you're reading on a, a a, window, a, a Macintosh or a Linux or Unix machine, and you're reading a Windows file, then the get line won't strip off that backslash, um, the, the backslash R or the, 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 the carriage return um, character. Okay, so since the get line function, both on you know, a Macintosh or a Unix box, Linux box, or Windows will strip off the new lines, whatever that happens to be. Um, when we print it out, we can we can add the new lines back in again, like this. Um, and so if we run that, you'll see that will make it look a little nicer. Um, it prints the, the dog and the cat. Now, curiously, it prints an extra line if you see. So look, what we can do now is we can actually print Okay, let's do it this way. Let's print the line, then let's print some spaces, then let's print in parentheses the line size, or, or we can call it length, it's a string, right? So do you see what I'm doing here? I'm printing, every time I'm printing what the line is, and then I'm printing in, in parentheses what the length of that line is. Let's see what that does. Why would I do that? It's so that I can understand why it's having that third line and this is the kind of annoying thing you get when you get into reading files and writing files. You get these strange edge effects like this. The file's only two lines long, and it reads dog first, and then it reads cat next, and then it reads, it's not really done reading the file yet because you haven't actually gone past the last character. It's still waiting for you to read again. So when you, if you look in the source window, when you call this file end of line function, it says, oh, you're not done with it. There's actually no more characters to be read in the file, um, but it doesn't give you the end of file yet because you haven't read past the last character. So it calls this one more time, but then get line returns zero. Um, all it means is that you have to be a little bit aware when you're reading a file of cases like this. So we just have to check against the case of a zero length line um, when we read the lines. 
So let's go back to what we're trying to do here. Um, let's look at the code back in the load function, right? So it's this code right here. We're trying to replace these lines of text with really a read from a file. So let's do a couple things. First of all, let's take this stuff and let's go back to our window to edit the file that we're reading and let's jam it in there, right? So I'm doing it here. You can do it on your platform any way you like, cut and paste. Um, whoops. So um, again, this is kind of a hacky stuff. So I'm gonna also take away the quotes and then I can take away this stuff too, right? So what we want is a file that has just the guts of the grid, right? We're gonna just read this grid in. We want the contents of this grid, of this file, I mean, to be loaded into the grid variable. So let's that's our test file. Let's go back to the source window now and let's let's rework this. Let's let's call this load, let's call it load from file just to be specific. And let's put in here, we're gonna give it the name of the file to read, right? Uh, let's call it file name. Okay. So let's let's go back and use this code we're starting here. Let's just grab all this and let's go up here and stick it in here instead, right? Okay, so try to follow along here. We got a we're calling load from file with a file name. Um, and actually let's go down and look at how we call that. So instead of calling load, we're gonna say load from file. And we're going to say test here. So we're going to put this code back in again, right? So we have a grid. Um, we load it from a file. And so instead of instead of test here, we're going to actually use this file name variable so that this same piece of code can be used for reading different files in. We're going to loop until the file is done, and then we're going to be done. But now. we want to do something like one of these lines. We're not gonna have seven of these. We're only gonna have one of them, right? So we're gonna be putting this line inside the loop, right? This is the key line right here. We've, we've read a line from the file and then we want to do something to set this lines variable. So this is the first challenge. See if you can write that code that will call the right function on the lines variable. Um, and think a little bit about the line feed issues, if that matters or not. Okay, so go ahead and give that a try and just see if you can get something to compile. And if you get it to compile, run it and see if it will print the correct grid um, for you, okay? Give that, a, give that a try. Okay, welcome back. Let's walk through that together. And I'm gonna show you how, if you're not careful in checking the length of that line, um, how you can create an invalid grid and then how our check routine will flag it as invalid. So let's let's go through that step by step. So first of all, we can leave this print and that's fine. We'll just leave that for our debugging. But now lines, we're not going to push back. This thing is not valid anymore, right? This was just happened to be just one of the lines that I had from the previous time. So that has to go for sure. And what goes in its place? It's going to be just the line that we read, right? Uh, it's really that simple. That part's that simple. So, but we know from before that this is gonna read the seven lines of the file, and then it's gonna read that eighth line that's gonna be empty, and it's gonna push back an empty line, and then that should vi uh, violate this check because the length of that empty line won't match the length of the first line. So let's see if that's right. First of all, let's see if this will compile. And it does, and let's run it. And here we go, and that's what happened here. So. Make sure you understand what's going on there then. Because of the weird way that files get read and you get this, you get this final empty line read, um, it will fail this check. But this is really a good thing. This is, because if that had gone into our program, it would cause all kinds of problems having an empty line. So it's already, our check routine is already proving to be valuable in catching some kind of strange condition when we read files. So let's go back to the source window and we can um, fix that. And that's the next challenge. Fi how do you fix this so it'll work? You want, and I, okay, so I'll give you a hint. Stop it if you don't want the hint. 
um, you want to check to see if the line is empty. And if the line's empty, don't push it onto the grid. Just skip that line. Okay. So go ahead and give that a try. Okay, welcome back. And let's see how you did. It should be something like this. It's really not too hard. It's if, it's going to be a conditional operator. If line length um, is greater than zero, then push, push the line to there. That is one way to do it. Let's give that a try. And it works. Um, a little bit nicer way to do it, a little more standard would be to say, if line is not empty, um, that should give the same result. And it's a little cleaner. It's, a, it's, a, it's what they call a narrower interface. If you, can, if you can get by with a function that has a less complexity, so empty returns true or false, and that's generally a narrower, smaller, simpler interface than calling the line length, which returns an actual number. So rather than calling a routine that turns a number and then checking if the number is greater than zero, if you just call a Boolean empty, that's seen as a, a simpler way, a better way to make that, make that query. It, it, it captures the essence of what you're trying to ask, the question you're trying to ask, and it, and it, creates, it, re it reduces the opportunity for bugs later in the code. If you were to check the size and someone saw the zero and they replaced it with a one, for instance, then maybe it might have a bug where it would um, not push back lines with one character. That's just one example. Um, so anyway, let's check that this one works as well. And it does. Um, so we're close. Um, at this point, sometimes debugging statements like this, I, in the source code, I would leave those in sometimes just because it's, if you, if you just delete it, you're going to lose it, which you can do later when you're ready to sort of move the code on. But when you're developing the code, sometimes just these kind of, it's like a printf in the old C world. It's just a printing to the C out as a way to just debug things informally. Um, and they're just, in practice, they're just quite useful when you're trying to just work through code. Um, I'm kind of cheating in this entire course by not really doing a lot of uh, uh, test environments. When you're doing professional code, you'd be writing unit tests all the time for every piece of code you write. Um, and, that's, and that's fine too. That's a really a better way to design. In fact, you can write the test first um, and then you know define what the function should do and then write the code. It's just for learning how to code and recreational code. I think um, you know that can be overkill when you can just see the code is doing what you want it to do more simply without the overhead of investing in a big uh, test framework. Um, but obviously in a production environment, you know, you want to be testing every line of code with a separate piece of code that runs specific tests on it. But for us, just running it and seeing that it, you know, printing it and seeing that it does what it's supposed to do um, is fine. So we're, we're close here. Let's test this by changing the code. Let's say let's put in something different here. Maybe we put another dot in here. Uh, maybe a dot here and a dot here. Right? So we're going to change the actual grid that we're loading. Um, let's run that. Now we don't even have to recompile. We can just rerun it. And now see that'll load the new grid without any change to the source code. So let's put that back just because we want to stick with our example. And again, I'll show you that that produces back to the old one, the one that we want. So here's a challenge. Let's suppose we would like to add the functionality so that we could do this. In our file, let's say that we want comments. And sometimes comments are with a hash mark like this. This is a test file. Now we want any statement that has that pound sign, that hash mark in the first character position to be ignored. That helps us add, you know, and then we can add any kind of comments more comments, right? So this is all, this can be added. You could add a comment in here, but that's not a case I was particularly interested in. It's more about putting comments before the grid. And you can say who who wrote it, what's this grid supposed to do? And we'll find that useful later when we start making more grids um, to fill out for different sorts of test purposes. So how do you support this? So that's the challenge is see, this is a little tricky, but see if you can write the code and it's gonna require an if statement that will, read that file in and still create the grid that we had before without um, 
treating the comment line as data. So give that a try and see what that does. So welcome back. Let's see how you did that. I'll show you one way to do it. Um, it's really another check on this same condition we had here. If the line's not empty, um, we're gonna push back. Well, we need an operator here. We wanna say if the line's not empty um, and the line has uh, is not a comment. So the logic's a little tricky. Um, you can think of it a different way, but let me, let me do it this way first. Um, so if the line's not empty and the line first character is not a pound sign. Okay, so there's a lot there. Let's let's unpack that. First of all, this is a little tricky. This line checking the first character of a line, if you were to ask the line to give it the zero character, if that line is empty, that statement right there would be illegal. That would cause a core dump right there. We're saved by this. Uh, C and C, and I think other languages too have this property where they guarantee that if the first condition in one of these big and statements fails, it will not execute the second condition. That's important because this will fail if the line is indeed empty. So if it ran those both together, for instance, um, this one, you know, the first one would, um, would fail, but if it ran the second one anyway, it would core dump and it'd be too late to recover. Um, so we're going to say if it's not empty, that means if it comes in and tries to access this, it's, we already know that it's not empty. So it does have a first character, character zero. Um, and we're going to say not equal. Now, this is just like in the assert statement. Remember, the double equals was an equality check, not an assignment. This, this um, exclamation mark equal is not equal, just like the, just like the not up here. This not on, is, was a not statement. This is a not equal operator. And then this is an and. It's a logical and. So it's saying if the line is not empty and the line is not a comment, then we're going to accept it as an actual data line. So that's really all we need. And then this the last thing there, I guess, to note is that this is, again, a single character. Uh, this produces one character out of that string. And we're checking to see if that is the same as that character. So let's compile this and see how we do. Well, we haven't compiled in a while because we had just data. <laughs> so we compile and we run it and um, great. And it looks like it looks like it passed the check. Let's try one more just anti-check just to show this. Let's put a space in front of there, right? So now we're saying blank, blank, this is a test file. Um, this is a challenge. Go ahead and try something like this and see what happens. And let's see if it does read in garbage data, does our check function catch it so that we don't continue on with garbage data. Okay, welcome back. That should have been pretty easy. Let's try it here. We don't have to recompile again. That's just a data change. So we run it and boom, it says, it says, um, right, it fails. It fails in 35, line 35, which is this line here that's doing the check. Um, right. And it never got to the print. So we don't actually even we don't actually even see what it read. If we wanted to see what it was doing a little more, you could uncomment this print line here, and then now you have to recompile, um, and then you can run it, and you can see that it um, that it is treating this as a 23 character data line for the grid. So it actually put in that as the first line, and then it and then it said, oh yeah, that doesn't the second line doesn't match the length of the first line. Um, okay, great. So we've learned how there's some ASCII characters in the file. We've learned how to read those files into strings in our C++ world. And then we've learned how to write that information into the grid so that we no longer have a hard-coded dependency in our C++ files on the, on the data. The next thing we're going to do in the next module is use the same idea to load from a file, but we're going to read the library. So now we can read a dictionary um, of 12,000 words and start to see if we can fill out 
that grid. So it's going to get more exciting here. Hang with it if you're enjoying this. I really, um, I really hope you'll stick with it and um, get to the part where you'll see the program start to do interesting things with this data now that we've been preparing it to understand and analyze and manipulate. So we'll see you in the next lecture.